Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first video slash podcast that you'll be hearing of the brand new Longside podcast. Literally, this is a brand new idea that I thought of about five hours ago because I realized that over time, I really enjoy talking about Burnley. You may notice that if you follow me literally anywhere on any social media on YouTube or Twitter or Instagram, and I'm quite regular on going on many of these podcasts like Talk BFC, like Turfcast, like Known and Ever. I always thought, why not go out of my way to just make one myself? So this is the home of the Longside podcast. Surprisingly, and I was surprised, I was quite surprised to see that this was already taken, but it's not. So I'll take it now. So I'm not here alone. I've got my friend Connor with me that you've seen quite soon. So if you're new here, then please feel free and leave a comment, subscribe to the channel already. Uh, because there'll be many more videos in the future. Over here, it'll be a lot more casual in terms of how I'll be presenting these videos. I've got some great ideas as well in terms of some guests, some people involved on the higher up of the YouTube community that I've already reached out to or have reached out to me, and I think we'll make some great content in the future. So with that said, let's get my co-host on. And Connor, how are you doing, my All friend? Right, I made it. I've made it. I'm officially famous. <laughs> <laughs> um, to introduce um, how me and Connor um, kind of met, I've seen him and worked with him, w- w- worked with him alongside other podcasts. Well, I think Talk BFC, and I yeah. felt like he is quite sensible to say the least. So I thought that to start off on a least controversial note, make sure there's nothing too mental going on, and it doesn't get cancelled instantly. I thought Connor would be the best one to get on. So I, I, I hope that that um, <laughs> that suits you well, personally. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. To be fair, I think we've uh, we uh, hit it off quite well, didn't we? When we were doing Talk FC and and you know, it's the start of a new chapter. I'm it's exciting. Well, thank you very much for your time and for coming on, and I appreciate you guys also. So, I'm new to this kind of new uh, website. I'm using Streamyard. You've seen it a thousand times. So, Matt as well. It does work. Happy day. So, you can see all the comments as well and get you guys up on the stream. So, of course, if you are new here, feel free and subscribe to the second channel. So, let's begin. And I feel like there's so many different things that we could talk about about, about Burnley and what is currently happening to us. And we can speak for hours upon hours across multiple different videos. So for this one, I just wanted to go specifically into the future of us because I don't want to say we're already promoted, but I think it's like 98% if you look at all the supercomputers and nonsense like that. So we are pretty much going to go up this year. I think, I don't think that's even a, 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 a situation that we're being like, naive i think that is just the fact of the matter here so unless if you disagree um do you connor no i think i think unless you did like it would go down as probably like the biggest championship bottle job ever i don't think there'd be a bigger one uh would have to it'd be very impressive if that was to happen um i just can't see a way we f- slip away now i, I think, think it would actually be I think even if we went out of our way to try to <laughs> cock it up, I don't think even then it'd be possible because in that sense, we are also relying on all of the other teams to also catch up to us at the same time. So even yeah. if we lose all our games, it still allows them to catch up, I think, six wins on us individually, six different wins. It, yeah. it, it's going to be a very impressive feat. So we can talk about how we kind of reflect on the season kind of treat this as it's the first episode as like a halfway stage so we can speak about player the season young player uh, young player the season signing of the season flops potentially as well and then what we can expect for next year so for you connor as like a starting question who would you yeah. say uh, has been of our squad this year our most important player because i think that is it's easy to say the best player but Back, I remember this conversation back in 14, 15 of like our most important player. And everyone was saying Danny Ings was our best player, best player and whatever else. But I love Trippier and I felt like he was vital for our system. Yeah. So who would you say is our most vital player? Uh, oh, see, there's a few that you could say. I mean, me personally, I know it's, it's quite an easy choice really, but I think Jack Cork is just so essential to the Burnley team. He's, 
you notice the difference. Oh, there we go. Someone's agreed. Uh, it, I mean, is there anybody that runs that midfield better? I mean, Cullen is a great midfielder. Don't get me wrong. But I just think Cork sets the tempo for the team and we look so much calmer and collect- more collective comfortably when he's in- on the pitch. Whereas I think when you watch us with games where he's not starting or he's not on the pitch, I don't think we look as confident. And I mean, last night against Ipswich, yeah, it wasn't the best game, but I felt like, I feel like Cork is somebody that is, he's going to be the big one to replace, I think, come, whether that be the end of this season or next. I think he's, you've got to spend some serious money just to to replace him. And, and for that reason alone, I think we've watched the team chop and change quite a lot, um, quite regularly this season. But he's the one that, when he's not starting, I think we notice a bigger difference. I do agree, to be fair. I I really do like how Cork has defined himself in his system. Because because last year, we can't forget that. I remember very well that we were playing Westwood and Brownhill. And it was, it was like the entire fan base was screaming at Sean Dyche to, to say that, it, it doesn't work. Westwood and Brownhill, they're two very similar players um, in my perspective. And I think a lot of fans can agree with that. So to see Cork, when we, when he was playing, he started playing well. We won quite a few games in the last year. Sadly, wasn't, wasn't enough. And with his age to come out to championship and really he- just prove himself to be the leader that we know he is and use that experienced head... And he just does all the simple things well. And I love that from him. But I really do want to give some proper credit to Josh Cullen as well. And all the time, I'm kind of thinking that Josh Cullen, I'm preferring him a bit more sometimes. Because there's times that like the last five, 10 minutes of games that I see him just still sprinting around, putting in all the effort in, getting into, getting into, getting into every single tough tackle. And he's showing that leadership in a different kind of way that he is just he's quite I don't think I've ever seen Josh Cullen smile I don't think I don't know if you have seen him (laughs) smile I don't know but he's (laughs) yeah he's a leader by how he represents himself and I think that's really important for the for the squad and I don't think that there's a player that isn't like that I must say Mm. but I really do like what Cullen represents. Uh, looking at chat here, got Jacob saying it's Cork, um, CD saying Murich, which that is. That's that an was going to be the outside because... shot. That was going to be the outside shot. Do... Thing is, we're still winning games without him, but saying we're still winning games without Cullen or Cork, I guess. But I don't mm. think we fall apart if we didn't have Murich. But Murich is very important in terms of how easy that we uh, disperse pressure from the opposition and make ourselves not uh, predictable to, to cause down. So, absolutely for me. Um, Aaron Wright said Cullen um, and Goodmanson from Ashy Barnes. The Ashy Barnes, of course. And then <laughs> Howard Bellis from CD12 as well. Um, which, I, think I mean, there's some great players. That's the thing. That is an actual debate of like, there's so many great players on the team that seems to be all very vital for our system, which just shows the, the strength of our team that we have right now. Definitely, definitely. I couldn't agree more. And I think, I think the fact that we can just keep chopping and changing, it's quite a hard question to who's the most important because almost everybody in the team has had time out of the team and we've still been so good this season. At, you know, like, that's a good question for you, actually. Do you know how many teams come down like Fulham or Norwich, come to the championship, they beat... They do a job. They go. They get up, promoted, and whatnot. But I, it, you could make an argument that we are the best for points and style, like one of the greatest championship teams. And obviously, people say about Reading and the record. I think if even if we come close to it, surely we've got to be. I don't know. What what's what's your thoughts? Because for me, I, I can't think of many teams that have gone into the championship and done what we've done, like in this way, anywhere. We're definitely at the top of it. We're definitely near the top. But I remember Norwich with a Brendia season. Remember, of course, Fulham last year with Mitro scoring, what, how was it, 40 goals? Something ridiculous yeah. like that. So <laughs> Norwich and Fulham's are the likes. Even Leeds, you could say. Wolves, they had a fantastic team. There was a fantastic team that's done well in the championship and absolutely smashed it. And we are reaching that level that the more times that we just keep on winning... 
yeah, we're putting ourselves in that conversation. And really that idea of reaching that potential Reading 106 points total is getting more and more possible each week. And I think I said after, what game was it? West Brom at home? Then if we win that, I think it's possible. Then I said, yeah, okay. But if we go to Norwich and beat them, then I think it's possible. And I've done it again. And the thing is, I'm trying to not give myself hope purely because it's to protect myself. You know, if I, I'm like, I'm terrified for, for some reason against like Millwall away or Luton away. I just am because it just feels like that kind of typical fixture that can trip you up. Um, so I'm trying to protect myself for obvious reasons because I don't want to believe the hype completely all the way. Even though I completely believe at the same time. Yeah. If that makes any sense, I'll be honest. No, I completely no get it. I completely get it. But I feel like being able to drop 10 points is a massive bonus, especially because we're in the, the latter stage of the season now. It's it's something that it's so doable, but it, I can just imagine us either matching it or just being just below it or something like that. Like Because we've not really had a bad patch of form. I mean, the start of the season when we were all sort of trying to get used to it and we were drawing games where we should have won. Maybe you could go, that was our bad patch. But you know, at some point, there's going to be like, we'll lose like one or two games and people will be like, oh no, it, it, this is where it all crumbles. But I think for me, I just, I can't see us. I mean, you look at the games that we've got coming up, the winnable games really for us and the way we're playing at the minute, we're on fire. And it'd be so disappointing if we were to, get overconfident, especially like we, we said at the start, you know, we're practically promoted in some ways. Um, I think to, to throw it away because we get too confident and stuff. And then you, you're one of those, you were good, like a Fulham last season, you were good in the championship, but you want to be the best team. Like that'd be something that I'd tell my kids about is how good we were that season, you know? And I'm just scared oh, of yeah. you, Matt. <laughs> But, Absolutely. Yeah. Like we do need to realize that what we are watching right now is incredible and will be documented as one of the greatest championship seasons. Potentially, we're almost there. We've got to make sure that the wheels don't fall off, but this could be a historic season. And the fact that we are a part of that is special. And as well, where we came from last year in the summer and all the disaster from the media that was going in at the, the, the chairman and the debt and everything, and that's going to be a fire sale in the new Sutherland. And, you know, I, I, I still don't forget that. I still don't forget what Twitter was like. I still don't forget the kind of general feeling of the fan base at the stadium in Burnley when you speak to fans across, you know, if you go over the night out, you go to project or whatever wherever you go go down to Maud. okay you speak to anyone that is if you're from burnley you're a burnley fan that's just how it is right and yeah. no one really were comfortable at that time and it was concerning so to see how we've come to this situation is truly incredible and i kind of wanted to speak about this because i feel like it is only a matter of time but about the topic of vincent company how can you see or where can you see the journey of Vincent Company and Burnley going, Connor? I think, and I, I'm, I'm almost certain that this is what's going to happen. I think we've got five seasons of company. I think we've got about five seasons. Five. And then, a, and then I think City come calling for him. I think, especially with what's going on at City at the minute, it's all up in the air, but I mean, it's almost certain that he's going to be at City at some point, isn't it? Like, it's a certain. Um, but my camera, did, my camera has died for a second. I just, re, I just um, reset it. But don't <laughs> you worry. But yeah, I think, um, I think for me personally, I can't see anywhere else him going. I, I think that's the next step for him. Um, I think we've got the money to back him, especially if we go up. Uh, we've shown we're willing to spend. So for. For us, I think we get five really good years and then eventually he gets that call and then we have to find a replacement, which I can't imagine anybody else there. But then again, we said that about Dash, didn't we? And look at us now. I do think five is being very optimistic. I mean, he has signed a four yeah. to five year contract, which is very important. I met, um, look back on it when he signed back in July, it was that it is a four to five year deal that the Athletic confirmed. So even when company were, were very much a unknown figure in terms of 
is quality as a manager. Clearly, Pace saw something great in him because that's a quite a big risk if it didn't work out. You know, we've seen many managers of great stature in the game as a player, but not matched that as a manager. So clearly, Pace saw something that we didn't see because even when we were looking at it back in July or August and people asked us, oh, what do you think about company? How do you think it'll do? He couldn't really say much because we, we saw what he did in Belgium, which was a, a decent job, but people that didn't look at it because I guess people on the outside won't, they'll look at a surface level and think, oh, Anderlecht, they're a big club. They didn't win a league. Must be poor. You know, must, must have been a bad job. When in reality, they were going through some financial issues and they were just playing kids the entire time and all the best kids like Lekonga, like Doku, get, kept, kept on being sold and you know every year to feed the fan, finances that was going mm. wrong at the club. So... I think they went from eighth to fourth, then third. And I don't know exactly where they are now, but I think last time I saw they were eighth or tenth. Um, yeah, they dropped I had to down. check right there. So I saw the, the the owner or someone on the higher of that let's say that you know they were quite upsetting. It was they were quite upset to let company go as easy as they have because clearly he he was doing a great job over there. And also, I think Josh Cullen, Josh Cullen is clearly a big miss. But yeah, right now the tenth, so it, it's 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 not shocking, but it is really impressive to see how far he actually is um, in terms of a top of a manager in Vincent Company. Yeah, definitely. He's. A, I mean, I think the feeling was when we got him that he's a manager that, and and I think when he came to Burnley originally, there was a it was this is a long-term project, not a quick fix. Um, and I don't think, from what I've been told, I don't think they were expecting us to go up this season the way we have. I think it was more build a core squad this season, then next season push for promotion and take it from there. But it seems as though, like, it's just the momentum has just built and built and built and we just seem to be steamrolling teams. I mean, that Norwich game, I... I was dreading Norwich because I thought with the, the injuries and stuff that oh that this will be like the first tough fixture for us. But I mean, we made it look so easy, and the passing, and we, we just played them off the park. And I don't think, I don't think if we'd have gone down with Dash, it'd have been the same. I think, I don't think Pace would have invested as much. I don't think Dash should have brought the players that he'd have brought in. I just think y- you look at this season. It's gone almost perfectly for us, really. I mean, there's been a few injuries here and there, but um, we, we've we've had such a good year, and I'm almost like don't want to go up. I've enjoyed this season that much, um, but I yeah, know I'm in the same boat that yeah. if we can somehow win the league and stay in the league, then yeah, you know, I'd be down for that. Really, um, I don't think that's possible, but <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna it's gonna hit like a ton of bricks, you know, next year that we're gonna go into Premier League and then realize that we're not winning each game, and then the depression will hit. Then that'd be a big problem. Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine the fact that we won't win each game in Premier League. Well, we think anyway. You never know. Um, yeah. But you'd you'd imagine that we won't be winning each game, um, and we will go into that very soon in terms of the Premier League next year, as that is. Again, not confirmed yet, but if we're being honest with, with ourselves, it's very much likely. Um, in terms of our team that we have right now, Connor, where where do you see us if we had our SAT team playing the way we are playing right now? If we were in the Premier League, do you think that we'll stay up? Oh, that's hard. I think looking at the Prem teams this season, and a lot of my mates are, are fans of Premier League clubs, this season have, have been like, it's been apparently horrendous. Like, there's not a lot of consistency in the league. And I feel like we showed against Bournemouth how good we are. And I, ideally, I would have liked us to get a Prem team in the FA Cup draw, just to see where we were. But we played Bournemouth off the park, and I know they're in the relegation zone, but we looked so good against them. So... You'd have to. I'd, I think we'd just be lower half mid table. Do you know, like I can't think who's there, but like you know, like twelve, thirteen, somewhere like that. I think we'd be all right because I think we we play some really good football, and I think a lot of teams won't be able to handle the pressing that we do. 
I would like to also say that with some confidence, um, <laughs> but I just don't want to come across like I'm being too because it, there is a big difference. There is a big difference of playing against championship championship teams and Premier League teams. There is a big gap, and that gap is only ever widening each season now. Clearly, um, CD12 in chat says 14th. Of course, if you're currently listening on YouTube, feel free and interact and give us your thoughts on where can you see Burnley being if we were in the Premier League right now. I would like to say that we'll stay up because I do think there's teams that are much more poor in terms of their attack. And our attack is... The best part about it is that we aren't overly reliant on one player. If one player has a poor game, then it's fine. We'll sub on Benson, or we'll sub on Teller, or we'll bring on Goodmanson as a 10, or, you know, that Twine can score a free kick in the last five, 10 minutes. Like, there's so many goal scorers as he know. We're not... like keep in mind boys i don't think we've had a striker score a goal for us in the last like two three months like not one of our strikers in ashley barnes or jay rodriguez or foster no one has scored a goal for us in three months i don't think i think the last goal from a striker was against rotherham at home and that was in like late october i swear so the fact we've not actually had a striker score a goal for us in how long and we are still where we are right now is insane maybe i'm wrong maybe you can update me but Barnes' only two goals was against Blackburn. So yeah. it would have been Blackburn, right? Yeah, sorry. yeah it would have been yeah. Blackburn. That was the last goal from a striker. Which even then is yeah. still ridiculous as that's like late November. But I think before then it was no, no Rotherham for J-Rod. So yeah, that's just... If I would say where we would be in Premier League now, I'd probably say... I want to say 16th. Because I think that if... Bournemouth, we played them and we played really well. And I think that was their full strength other than Lerma, from what I gathered. So even though it's a cup game and cup games don't mean much, we did play really well. And against United, we had some rotation. I thought we did really well. So I would say like 16th. Yeah. But it is still a big ask to really compare the Championship and Premier League. But I think that we are, as of right now, the way we're playing and the confidence if we can keep that up for a little bit in the Premier League, if we go up, whatever, that'll do us a big a big chance. But then there's that other conversation of when we do go up, if we do go up, whatever, what signings or what areas on the pitch do you think that we really need to aim at? I think a replacement for Cork is essential. And I think... See... I've not seen anything of Foster yet to go, he's the striker that we needed. Do you know, and I, I think it's too way too early to say, like, write him off or anything like that. But I think he's, I think they'll go for another striker in the summer. I think Barnes and Jay are gone at the end of the season. Um, they've been really good. Servants, My friend, but... have you forgot the best striker in the world without Vegost? <laughs> have you forgot oh, about yeah, him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure he'll the do goat. such a good the job goat, with his man. two goals a season. <laughs> oh, no, nah, I don't no, I think he'll do that. He's, he's a six foot six man that can't score with his head. It's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, other than tapping us oh. West Ham away, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's all I've seen is like, oh, well, Vegas will come back next season and he'll he'll replace Barnes and Jay. I'm like, I'd rather do another season with Ashley Barnes than, than Vegas come back, genuinely. I don't want him anywhere near the club and I'm hoping we just get rid at the end of this season. Because, I mean, he's showing at United. He's not that good. He's not done anything amazing. He's a bang average striker for the Premier League. And I think it's easy enough to go and do it in the Bundesliga because how many players have come from the Bundesliga and then not really worked in the Prem? Um, I get I that. But again, yeah. I did score, I think, like 20 goals like in like back-to-back-to-back years. I think it was like 16 goals and 18 and then 20. Like... I still believe, in my own opinion, that Vegos is a great player. However, his ego is definitely a problem. I think I was well open to him coming to Burnley. And even now, to an extent, like if company has spoken to him and if company feels like, in his own opinion, that he thinks he can still do a job, then I back what company decides. However, mm. when I saw him go to United and then I think the next day, Slander Besita saying that the training schedule, the training um, program wasn't up to his levels or up to his standards. I, I just saw that thinking like, are you purposely trying to piss off every single club that you go to until you get to the next new shinier thing? And let's be honest here, 
There's nothing more shiny than Manchester United. I mean, have you seen his Instagram? I've never seen a guy so active. He's making tweets every day because of why wouldn't you? He's gone from being at Burnley that gets like, you know, 12,000 <laughs> likes per post. And now he's getting like 150,000 almost every time. And, and it sounds really kind of like irrelevant to say that, but I do really believe that that is a side of it that he really cares about. So there's no way he'll take that drop from United, in my opinion, and come down to Burnley because I think his ego just surely won't allow that. But as I stated earlier, if company thinks that he can still do a job, then I got to back whatever company decides. I just really would be surprised with it. Uh, research in the, chat, in the chat saying that apparently in Pacers' notes, I presume in the program, that he pretty much said that he's gone, which, of course, I've not seen that, but that wouldn't particularly surprise me. And yeah. uh, Mello, who's in fact a Watford fan, saying that, um, hope you're keeping well. I think that Rovers will beat us. Don't you dare say that. Do us a job, pal. We appreciate it. Um, CD12, speaking about Foster, um, I think that we paid too much for Foster, which I I can't exactly disagree because it did seem like a bit much for him. Um, Just because I felt like it was kind of unnecessary because of where we are in the the table. It's like, I'd rather wait till the the summer to get that new Mm. striker. But clearly, company sees something that he really wanted. And we may have not seen too much of him right now, but... We kind of thought the same about Manuel Benson when he first came in. We kind of thought that maybe he wasn't exactly maybe too lightweight. I've been hearing that complaint about Foster already, which, of course, people can make their own opinions. But I think it is still early days. So only time can tell with Foster, I think. What What do you think? Yeah, I think it's way too early. Um, I think it's way too early to say whether we've over or underpaid because we don't know. Like, you can't really say it off. He's, he's probably only played about 40 minutes properly. Um, I mean, he had he pulled up with cramp last game, and I mean, he was a part of the first goal. But do you know, like, it's it's way. I think he's a good striker for this level. I mean, we'll have to see what he's like. You know, in a few more games, we'll be able to give a bit more of a judgment. But to sort of uh, to sort of write him off and say we've paid too much, just it doesn't feel right to say it this early. I think. Give him a couple of, of weeks to sort of play a couple of games, pick up a bit of momentum. Because, I mean, to be fair, Jay looks knackered. It looks like every time he plays, he's knackered. And I think Barnes gives his all, but he can't play every game. So, like, it's nice to have a new striker. I know that sounds really stupid to say, but when we got Vegas, how excited were we all? Because it was like a brand new striker coming to the club. I think, how many strikers would you reckon we've signed in the past couple of seasons? I mean... Vegas Not many. Um, and that was only because Chris uh, Wood left. So yeah, it's, it's, I'm pretty sure that we signed Vegost. And then the one before that was, dare Jay? I say, Jay Wood again from West Brom? Yeah. And mm-hmm. then before that was probably Vidra and then Wood, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Um, so yeah, getting two strikers in literally two days was a, a sight to <laughs> behold on Twitter, I must say. Um, Rowan. Um, in the comments, of course, feel free, lads, and leave your comments as well. Um, Foster has brought a lot of South African fans, which is always nice. And I do believe that that is a kind of, that is a side of it that I do believe that Alan Pace is really looking at to expand the club to foreign fans across the world, the Moroccan supporters for Zaruri, who he actually was originally Belgium, of course, before he yeah. um, um became eligible to play for Morocco for the World Cup, of course. But then the fans over in Belgium, and then, of course, a lot of Belgian fans are kind of looking at us, thinking that we're now the Belgium team in England, so they'll start supporting us and cheer us on because if we're doing well, it kind of means that we are also representing the Pro League as well over in Belgium, so it kind of shows that, Mm. oh, Belgian football is good and that they have got some great talents over there. So we are... It'd be a similar sort of effect to, like, not not in Wolves of Portugal, like... Maybe even like um, I think Brentford that they've got like a lot of Scandinavian players. That it almost like shows that they 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 have got some good little players over there and players of people over in Scandinavia. They kind of like Brentford because they're representing those, those Danish lads really well. So when it comes to pace, kind of ditching the the mentality that we had for several years under Sean Dyche, which of course is no discredit to Sean Dash that we were seen as a kind of Brexit hard man, 4-4-2, poor shithouse football, football club. And it was very clear that Pace wanted to kind of completely move away from that because it does play a factor when it comes to 
not just players, but also sponsorships. Like you kind of want to become an attractive club for sponsors. And that does play a big factor, I do feel like. So it's great to see that. And also on top of that, Vincent Company. I mean, Christ, who else is better to improve your club in terms of reputation across the entire world than bringing in a Hall of Famer Premier League player who is suddenly one of the most attractive like football managers in the world? Um, not just by looks, but also by his actual style on the pitch. Honestly, it, it, it's a master truck, master truck by Alan Pace and AOK, which um, to see where we can be next year, thinking of the players we could bring in. Oh, there'd be, there'd be some names linked with Burnley in the summer that you would never even think of. I mean, you just saw Kalo Navas from Forest go to, well, from PSG go to Forest. I'm expecting David Silver to walk through the doors now. <laughs> David Silver, Eden Hazard. I think I don't even think Eden Hazard would actually start Ted Azurovi right now, saying that. Um, oh, no. I'm expecting some madness to happen in the summer, man. Um, Aaron Wright saying that it took Benson a few months to settle in, which, of course, we do expect the same for Foster. And, yeah. yeah, how do you see just kind of the job that the perspective of the club before has turned to now and um, how important could that be? for us i think it, i think the whole like oh we're a horrible team to play against and stuff you know like that that's all fun and games when you're you're winning games and stuff and, and we got into europe you know that only gets you so far really and that and teams then like fan bases start to turn on you and you almost have like a negative image and it got to a point where people were glad to see the back of us and like as funny as that has been to go and and beat a team one nil away from home, it's not entertaining for us. It's not entertaining for the fans. Why do you think I always drank like heavily <laughs> every away game, even home games? Yeah. Genuinely, honestly, it's it, and and I think it's just it it's the club has gotten, especially the playing style, it had gotten so rotten, especially last season. Last season, arguably one of the worst seasons for us because. Say, say we didn't get corner. What, what was the excitement of last season? There wasn't much. Yeah. It was yeah. horrendous football. You know, the fans weren't happy. I've I've been to Turf more now for about arguably twenty best part of twenty years. And like last season was so negative. It, it was every week you were trying to sort of defend it and be like, we're gonna come good. You know, Dash does this for us every season. But then I I used to always think. This shouldn't. I shouldn't be paying to watch this. Like this isn't entertainment. And seeing company come in and bringing these exciting young footballers in, that'll take a man on. Do you know what? Like, if you're relying on Dwight McNeil to take a man on, to to win your games, and be entertainment for you, you've got a serious problem on your hands. Because, I mean, you look at this season. How many times has Zahori gone past somebody? You could probably make the argument that Zahori's gone past more people this season. Than Dwight McNeil has for the past two or three. Do you know uh, like let's it, be let's be respectful. I think I think it, <laughs> and I suppose but gone past more people now than our entire squad has for the last three seasons. <laughs> that was Dwight McNeil. Like yeah. I think just the entire squad alone. Yeah, that's fair. That is, is definitely you can, fair. You can make a good point <laughs> for that, honestly. Um yeah, they, the what else what I was saying with reflection about our Premier League years, the the last two or three. Um I do genuinely believe that the Premier League became stale to Burnley fans because I feel like we all were so used to the same cycle almost every time. That we're so used to playing the same way against the same teams. And that when we first went to the Premier League and in that 16, 17 year, every game was a big game for us. It was a big moment to show what we can do because at the time we didn't actually think we'll still be there. You know, in 16, 17, 17, 18, we got up for it and alongside in the cricket field almost every game. There was great atmosphere because we still felt like it was something new. But then when we reached that kind of like 21, 22 year and the away games, you know, once you've gone to when you want to go to Southampton away for the fourth time now of another kind of like poor performance and it's kind of like a hope and cling on for the best. There's only so many times you could go to Southampton away or Wolves away or Bournemouth and not get kind of bored of that same cycle. So I think that the mentality of Burnley fans got a bit too complacent in the Premier League because it felt like it was the same thing each year. 
so that's why I was going down. I'm very much grateful for it because I feel like we'll be so much more appreciative of it next year and of the way that we're playing will be so much more exciting as well and the players are going to be watching. And of course, it is easier to say with hindsight, but going down was the best thing that could ever happen to this football club. And I, I thank Leeds fans and I thank Everton fans every single day because we needed this because... You could say in a world, maybe let's say if we stayed open, we could still get Vincent company. I, I don't think that we would be in a good situation because I feel like the, the players that we bring in will have so much more pressure on them to kind of like perform instantly, mm. which is going to be a tough ask. Like if he got Anasaruri instantly Premier League, we all know how important confidence is. Would he be the same player he is now? I don't think he would because for young players, it is a big ask to move to a new country, new league, especially the Premier League and expect to do well. So we need this year. So like so much. Um, Adam Gill, uh, a Sunderland fan saying, um, why does it look like Burnley are so much better away from home from an outsider's perspective? Um, I think, is that because we usually are on TV quite often when we're playing away, perhaps mm. like now it's on TV and, um, I'm trying to think actually of our games like QPR we were also on TV and we played fantastic then so I think the recent games on TV are usually away from home and we do really well and like West Brom was also on TV we're on TV a lot but you respect that because we're Vincent Company top of the league of course um, but yeah going back to what I just said how like going back in Premier League how did you feel about it when we were when we were in that situation I mean I look at it now and it's like a bl- it's almost been a blessing because you look at the two clubs that stopped up Leeds and Everton. I think both teams are in sort of distress really and they're, they're in need of of major work doing to them. Um and I think we'd have been in the same position as them if we'd have stopped up because we were in need of a, a massive reboot and I don't think we'd have had the time in the Premier League. You know, I I think you look at the squad we had, I mean, you were going to lose Tarkovsky, you were going to potentially lose quite a few players out of contract. I don't think you can replace them the same uh, if we stopped up. I don't think we could have. And you look at players like Corne this season, Corne has been out most of this season already, so we wouldn't have had him. I don't think McNeil's hit the, the ground running at Everton. You look at the players, there's only really me and Tarkovsky you could make a claim for in Port. Out of all the players that have left, that I'd say have I've I've had a good season. So I think we'd have really struggled. I think we'd have been in. I don't think we'd have been in a situation where Southampton are, where they've got players that are just they're just not good enough. They're not to the standard. Um, and I I just think us going down that last day was so glum after the high of beating Everton, which was arguably one of the best games to be at as a Burnley fan. Uh, and you, we really thought we were going to get through it to lose against Newcastle and to sit there on the last day of the season and just feel I I was so angry at full time I just left the ground and normally I'll <laughs> stay and I'll clap the players and stuff especially last game of the season that whistle went and I just went I just need to get out of here because it just felt toxic it felt horrible to be there and that might make me a bad fan I don't know whether that does or not but I just couldn't be in the ground I was so annoyed and upset and I came home and I was just like, it just, it hurt because we were so close. And because of probably the first half of the season where a few results just didn't go our way, we went down and it it was really bitter. And I think Pace has done, and I think Pace should get all the credit for me personally. He's proper changed the atmosphere around the club, whether that's him going around at the start of the game, chatting to fans and stuff, or bringing in a manager like company who's, boosted the positivity around the ground. You know, like, he has done so much since we got relegated to sort of, to change the direction of the club from this negative, negative football, negative fan base to now how excited Burnley fans are. And you can't, you know, like, how many games have we sold out this season compared to last? Like, apart from the big games in the Prem, you weren't, I don't think Burnley sold out the same. You have to be there on your phone or on your computer to just have a chance of getting a ticket now. And that's, you know, it's exciting. And there's a positivity in the air at the club and there's a good buzz. And that's not been there for a long time at at the turf, especially. Yeah. I I, kind of want to just have a little tiny talk about the current um, 
controversy about the, the loyalty point situation. Of course, if you're not aware, um, the Blackpool away tickets went up, I believe, two days ago. And I believe it was 3,400 plus tickets that was available. And on day one, it was for people of over 6,000 loyalty points. So I'm pretty sure per season ticket, I think it is, is it 300 you get, 300 points? Can you confirm? Uh, yes, it is. It's, it's I'm pretty sure that. it is. And I think every away game or every home ticket that you get individually, I think it's 10 points each, right? So I believe that is a current loyalty point system. And of course, it got sold out incredibly after one day. Um, Aaron Wright confirmed it's actually 350. My apologies. I knew it was 300 something like that. So yeah, 350 for season ticket and 10 per other ticket, right? So, so incredibly, you know, from only 6K as a minimum, they all went. This, of course, caused a lot of backlash. Younger fans of the likes that literally cannot get that many points on their account if they tried. Like 350 times 10 is 3,500. So realistically, you need to have like how many um, seasons to amass that amount? 13, 14 plus or so away tickets. It, it's really hard to do, right? So mm -hmm. away, uh, young fans are really annoyed by that, by the fact that they feel like they've been cheated out of the chance of going to to Blackpool away. And of course, this is not the first time that this has come up before. So how do you feel with the loyalty point system? Do you think anything needs to change? Because the way that I see it, right, is the fact that you can't please anyone. You, you, you can't please everyone, I mean. You can't please everyone. Because if you change it, then of course, you're going to have um, like older Burnley fans that's been going turf yeah. since we were in the fourth division. And they may, they may miss out because, you know, they may change the way that you're going to be going to X some of the games in the last three, four years. So they may miss that because maybe they can't go anymore. Maybe they literally cannot go to games as often as they can because of health reasons or financial reasons, whatever else. So how do you see it? I think really it's it, the local games. It's always going to be hard because everyone wants to go to the local games. It's a derby at the end of the day. And he said, all right, well, so many people get this many. You know, like if we'd have said, right, well, people with 2,000 tickets or uh, 2,000 points or above can do it. People that will be like, well, I was there at the bloody Orient game and I, I deserve a ticket. You know, like people like that would complain. So you're not ever going to be able to please the fan base. I mean, there's there's ways to watch it. You don't necessarily have to go to the game to be, you know, support the team. I know it's frustrating, but, you know, there's, there's tickets for Millwall that haven't sold out yet. So, like, if people are desperate to go to the away games, they can go to like Millwall and stuff. If it's if it's something that they enjoy, that's fine. I just think whatever you do, you're not going to please anybody. And I feel like I'm treading on ice just talking about it. And I, I'm somebody that, you know, I don't really go to away games. It's not something that, that I've ever really done that often. Um, but it, it's just, it's hard because I can understand it from young people's perspective. But I also understand that, you know, if you've racked up 6,000 points, you should get some sort of advantage to somebody that's only racked up that many, like 3,000 or something, you know. It's just, it just all perspective, isn't it, really? Like, you might have a completely different opinion to me on that situation, but for me, I think it's kind of just like, we only got so, you can only sell so many tickets, and we it being a local derby, it was always going to sell out straight away, whether, you know, because it's a good day out, Blackpool. It is a good day out, it has to be said. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot See, of people like saw that back in the you know the start of the year and thinking, yeah, I want to go to that one. I remember my brother; he said that to me back in August. Like he's gonna want to go and get the boys a black pool away. And I'm pretty sure that's a plan for pretty much a lot of people as well. Um, I think the situation is is that I don't think people say, "Oh, the away end will be full of OAPs because only old people can afford to you know, can get the the points to go." And it's like. I don't think it'll be the case. I think most people are like using like their, their dad's or like their granddad's account. And, yeah. you know, a young person is just buying a ticket on behalf of their account. So I don't think it'd be a situation that the full away would be full of people over 40 plus, right? So it is, I think, just a, situ a situation that you may just need to be a bit street smart, I think, because in reality, I cannot see Burnley changing it. I would love to see a world that we can maybe have a perfect system that both people who have collected points for across multiple years and have got to a certain age that they can get a chance 
and then people who have gone to X amount of games in the last three years. For I think England, um, England, I believe they have like a, a system similar to that, that if you go to X amount of games across a certain year period, that you get um, to like a minimum standard that you kind of get first dibs. Um, yeah. People using that as sample, right? Which is fair enough because as a person that has been part of that world, that um, knows of people who are young and, really are passionate about the club just as much as people who are older it does feel like they have been cheated out of this if they don't know an older person or a granddad or a dad or whoever else that can help them out so i i, I sympathize with people across both sides really because in reality there's never a chance that you could get a perfect a perfect solution to this so that's just kind of how i see it um because in reality this will always be a situation that pop up and guess what there's there's blackburn away coming up um so look forward to see the comps in that one um saying that i think the UN is definitely a lot bigger like i think it's like, up to like five or six k um yeah and looking back and i think preston I, d I don't think that had too much of a of an issue because i think it was out there for enough time that people had a chance to get to the game if they wanted to so yeah um that's kind of my my two cents on that, really. Um, coming uh, also in the news, I say in the news, it's been quite known for a while now. Sean Dyche, at Everton, um, a lot of Burnley fans that I've been speaking to, they seem to be in the same camp with they don't like Everton and they want them to go down, but because of Sean Dyche now, they now want to support them, but they also don't at the same time. It seems like a weird limbo. So uh, where do you stand with Sean Dyche and Everton? I'm going to say this now, right? I'm going to say this. And it's going to sound so horrible. I don't care. Do you know, like that? This this has been my big pet peeve about Everton and stuff, right? Is Dash isn't our manager. He hasn't been for over a year now, nearly. It's been nearly a year, hasn't it? It's coming up to a year, right? Do you know, like, he's gone, and and like I see a lot of people rooting for Everton, and I'm like, why? Because Everton breached financial fair play over however many years. That's the only reason they bloody stopped up last year. That's the reason we got relegated. So, like, there's nothing that could convince me to support Everton in the slightest. And he, I'm happy for Dash that he's got a Prem job after he's he's been waiting for one, hasn't he, for a while. But, like, I'm not then, like, I, I'm quite, I'm more than happy. I want Everton to go down. I wanted them from the start of the season. And them hiring Dash hasn't, hasn't changed that for me. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm so thankful for Dash. I think the stuff that he did with our club is amazing. But, do you know, we don't treat players with that same sort of, oh, I hope they do well. Do you know, like, you don't ever see it where next season when we go up and if Everton are up there, you're not going to go, oh, I hope it's a draw when we play Everton. Do you know, like... like you No, don't it wouldn't go to that players. level, I don't think. No, but do you know, like, I just... It, <sighs> There's like loads of managers we've had in the past that have done stuff for us. Do you know, what? I just feel like the Daesh thing of of like, oh, I need to support Everton now because Daesh is there. I just don't, I don't get that. And maybe that's me being grouchy or whatever. But I just don't, I don't get the whole we have to support Everton now because Daesh is there. Because you know he's he's gone. He got a nice paycheck off us. He did a lot for us. Don't get me wrong, but I shouldn't have to support a football club because. One of the reasons we're in the championship is because of Everton. Do you know that? That's my personal take, hot take. Yeah, that's completely yeah. fair. That's completely fair. Um, I mean, I, I don't think it's a it's, it's a case of supporting Everton exactly. Um, mm. Maybe it's like kind of just wishing them well of a soft spot. Maybe people have different words for it. Um, I I get your side of it completely. Um, I I think because I also know quite a few. Everton lads and when I lived mm. in Liverpool for a short time period I I kind of I, I seem to always bump into Evertonians more than more than Reds so the <laughs> ones that I spoke to they, they, they seem like sound lads to me they're, they're a bit mental but um, I completely get the kind of the, their passion for the football club so seeing Sean Dyche go to there it always felt like it was inevitable you know, if 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 you felt like any club was going to get Sean Dyche it was going to be Everton the only club that would only number one, not think they're too good for him. You know, you could, like, and because you can't really see a, let's say, Southampton, you know, with Sean Dyche. You can't see him going there. A Bournemouth can't see that. A, I was going to say, the only club I could see him going to that wasn't Everton was maybe Forest. 
because then he's, he's always had strong links to Forrest. I've always said that I can always see him going there, but after seeing Forrest back Cooper the way they did, I thought it's only Everton now. And he's gone there. And in my own personal perspective, I, I still love Sean Dyche very much for what he's done and for giving me in my childhood and in my teens the, the greatest days of my life at that time period, you know, going home and away, going to Olympiacos, going to Athens and then going to Aberdeen and all that, all that stuff. It, it, it's incredible to see where we've come um, from when I've been alive. And I imagine people who are older than me that saw us in the second tier or third tier or even fourth tier um, agree the same. So I wish him the absolute best and I hope that uh, he does well at Everton. That's just my own personal opinion. Um, but I do also agree with yours a bit as well, kind of because if it wasn't for Everton, we wouldn't be where we are now. Uh, but mm. In the same sense, I kind of thank them for that. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just kind of that's just kind of how it is right that. now. Um, so entering the last kind of like ten minutes of this of this pod or video, or whatever I call it. Um, in terms of let's say when, if when we go up, we hit we hit the summer. What two free signings can you see us making, and what two free players can you see us selling? Um. I think I definitely think a midfielder is going to come in. I think a midfielder, I think a centre half for Taylor Arwood Bellis, and see, I don't know. There's there's two there's two ways you could look at it. Right, is you could go for another striker as as a, and then you've got three decent strikers as options. But my partner said to me. Um, a goalkeeper because she's not sure on Muric. And, and I've originally heard that I was like, lot, no, you know. no chance because Muric is so good and he fits our system so well. But I, I kind of get it because he does have his moments and I don't think he'd be as, be able to be as relaxed as he is. But I don't know, it's all like subjective, but either a striker or a goalkeeper would be my, my third option. But I don't know, what and about you? Players, you potentially, players potentially going, you think as well? Oh. I think Barnes and Jerrod have definitely gone already. I'm pretty sure Jerrod's off to the MLS at the end of the season, anyway. Um, from what I've been told, anyway, that he's off to the MLS, and then, um, so I think two strikers will go. I think Cork might get another year, but I don't think he'll be a start for us. I think we'll go all in to get somebody as a a younger version of Cork, if that's possible. Um, yeah, and. I think Charlie Taylor might go. I think that's the only one just because I think he'll think, well, I don't want to just sit on a bench for another season. And I think if we sign Matson, I don't see him stopping. Then I think that'll that'll end that sort of situation. I think Taylor will... Because he will get a move. There'll definitely be somebody that'll want Taylor because he's a good enough left back in the Prem. Um, and he did a job for yeah. us for however many years. So I could definitely see it being a situation where Taylor goes, though. What about you? I think as far as I as far as I know with Taylor that he is we won't get in the way of him if an offer does come in that meets our valuation. Mm -hmm. And it does kind of rely on the fact that if we will keep Matson next year, and of course there's a conversation of the lawns and who would you rather keep ahead of anyone else? And I I, I as what you said, I can't see Bellis um, staying next year, mainly because I think that he would be simply overpriced um, in terms yeah. of what we already have and who can get in the you know like we've just picked up our Dakio and Ekdal you know for a, f a small amount you know a couple of mil like two mil three mil who are there which is yeah. in the championship is a lot of money but for a Premier League club like we are it's not really anything really is it um, compared to like let's see what Forrest have done for example Bournemouth so to see what we've done with these two you could think we could do that again, potentially. And um, so, Bellis, I think it may be a situation that it become a bidding war with us and many other clubs, and I think that we just won't win in that case. There's Bayer, who... Bayer, I think... I, I still don't know if there is a clause in that. I think there is, but I, I still don't fully yeah. know. But I, I think there is, but... There is, there uh, from is. What my, from what I remember, I think it was like 8 million euro, which if it is that, if it is that much, then I'll pay for it. If it is that much, I'll yeah. pay for it. Matt, so if I would, if I would say, if I can keep one loan player for the importance of our system, I would say Matson. Yeah, I think Matson is integral for our system 
of that left back who is so direct and so efficient when it comes to his, his attacking prowess. I think that he's still so young. He's 20 years of age and he can, he can still get so much better. I think when it comes to Matt Chelsea, I think they'll be very open to selling him for a price that won't be too insane. I'm thinking mm. like around like 50 million, which I think may be a price that I'm willing to pay for Ian Matson, considering what he can offer us value-wise in the future if he does kick on. Because mm. if he stands for, you know, at 20 years of age for 15 mil and he kicks on and does well for the Premier League, we've seen it before with like Cucurella, for example, he can then be sold for 60 million quid. You know, not saying he will yeah. do, but the possibility is there. Um so that's just my thoughts. Love and I, I love Teller. Like, I love the personality of Teller. I love how much she seems all in on the club. Mm. I've never seen a I've never seen a player so passionate. Like, have you seen how we've all seen how he celebrates his goals? We've all seen how he just kind of I, I do this each time we score a goal. I always kind of rewind it back each time a goal goes in. And I keep an eye on Teller because I never see a player move so fast. I've never seen a player put his arms up in the air and just stops just flinging his arms around like a madman. Even if even if he doesn't score. And I keep on thinking, this kid's on loan. He's not even fully here, in theory, which makes me think that he must be here. He must know he's here next year because, like, he's all in on everything and he absolutely loves it here. So I would love to keep Teller as well, but I guess it kind of depends on Southampton if, if they go down and how much they would want for him. So that's my thoughts on the loan players. Um, how, how, where do you stand by them? See, I think I, I've got it in my head, right? And this is... Connor Norwood conspiracies, but I think some of these loans, I think there's already like gentlemen's agreements on a lot of them. I think players like Teller, because they had the option to bring him back in January and they didn't, they weren't interested in doing that, which makes me think has something been sort of agreed in January maybe to say like, oh, at the end of the season, you can have him for this much. And I don't think that we, Chelsea would charge 15 million for Matson. you know. I've got a, I've got a feeling because they've got Cucurella and Chilwell, they don't need a third left back. And I don't know how long he's left on his contract, but I think we could get him for less than, than 15. I genuinely think we could. I think we could get most of these signings a lot cheaper. You look at the signings that companies made, um, they're all like young players and they're all next to nothing. So they must be some sort of thing, whether it's that we sign him for next, like peanuts and say, right, you can have a sell on clause or whatever. Um, but apart from maybe Taylor Alwood Bellis, I think we could get most of the loan signings if we wanted them. I think there's only uh, the lad from Brentford. I can't think of his name now. Um, Derv is ugly. Oh yeah, forgot about yeah. him as well. I'm, su I'm surprised he's still here. We signed two strikers in the summer, so that means we've we've, we've now got five strikers, including him. I'm yeah. very surprised to see that he's still here. Personally. Um, I don't know what happened with that because clearly he's not going to get a look in or, or will he? I don't know. That situation is really strange for me, really. Was that, I actually yeah. think he's pretty good. I don't think he's that bad, actually, Hilliel. He's all right. Uh, I think he's, that, a, he's an okay striker. I think if, it, if we had injuries, I'd, I'd, I'd be okay with him starting a game, but company's not wanted to play him at all, has he really? Which yeah, makes just, you think. It's weird. It's weird. Because I don't know, when I see him, I, I, I thought that he's got some nice little link-up play, he's, he's got a bit of confidence, he's taking man on, and I was thinking, okay, you know, there's something here that he's he's got for championship, but it's definitely more than capable, I feel like. So, mm. yeah, it's a weird one. Because I, I, I just then, as, as, as an example, we forgot that he was even here, um, which is a shame. <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah, in terms of the summer, I can see Barnes going, but I can't see him go at the same time. Like, I, I'm very happy that he stayed because not just of his resurgence of him as a player, but to see him, you know, become such an important part of the team now and become like a dad, you know, when it comes to protecting Anas or protecting Teller, for example. And then the fact that, you know, he's been here for almost a decade now and we can all agree that we all kind of thought you were past it, to be fair. You know, I, I think Sunderland Sund away, in that first half, when he started, and he got subbed for half time, you all thought that's probably the last time we see him burn the shirt. I think at that yeah. moment, we thought maybe it, it's just it's too much now. But fair play, fair play to Ashley Barnes. He's an absolute, like, I don't know how he's 33, I swear, and he, he's just completely just changed his game. He's got great first touch, he's pinging it left and right. And yeah, it's really good to see, and hopefully. 
uh, I'm I'm very grateful for the fact he has stayed because we can see him hopefully lift that title in in May, which I think would be a great send off. Um, unless if he wants to be a sort of you know emergency backup player for us next year, because I can't see him starting unless we well, have like three injuries next year. Him and Cork have been doing their uh, the training, haven't they? For is it the managerial the coaching badges? badges. Coaching badges. That's it. Yeah. Um, so. I could, I could imagine him getting some form of coaching role maybe at the end of the season, whether he wants to hang up his boots. But uh, yeah, I think it, it would be a case that he wouldn't, he definitely wouldn't be starting for us next season. I think, I think he's he's been a very good servant for us this season. I think if we'd have stopped up and he was our striker for the Premier League, I don't think it would have worked. He might have one more season in him in a, cha- in a championship side, but um, I definitely think companies probably said to him like, look, Give it till the end of the season, and I'll give you. I'll. You can do your coaching badges here and stuff. You know, you can still be a part of the club because he seems to love it up here. And I, I mean, he looks every time you see him in the videos and stuff. He's laughing and joking around with players, and and he seems to be having a good laugh. And and he seems settled. So you you don't know, dear. Do I mean, I'm sure we'll find out at the end of the season. But I I would I would imagine that company might offer him some form of coaching role. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, which would be great to see. I I would like to see that really. Um. So to end off each podcast, I'd like to ask uh, two questions to the guests that we have on. So the first one, these will be pretty simple, kind of Burnley. It's not like a, a question about politics. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, so the first one, what is your favorite all-time Burnley shirt? And of course, people in the chat can also comment down below as well. Um, it's got to be the white Adidas. Uh, the white Adidas, P3 Computers, uh, I think is it nineteen? I want to say ninety-five, and it's got the blue stripes coming down, and they fade off. It's like, oh, the perfect. I'm very shirt. surprised you said that one. I've not heard people say that in a long time. You know, actually, oh, I'm. I've done if you can tell, but I love Adidas. So uh, yeah, the, the Burnley Adidas stuff. I love all that. I think the so it's so nineties, and I'm so in love with it. But that the white away shirt is just like I've, I just got it recently. And I love it. It's my favourite T-shirt and I'll wear it to any occasion. It's like, oh, gold dust. <laughs> That's a good shout. That's a good shout, really. <laughs> um, like when I think of like, it depends on, in terms of my own personal preference, because you can either pick the one that you had from your childhood that you, yeah. remember, you remember very fondly or one that you just like the look of it. Like the shirt I'm wearing today, which is I think it's the, the – all five, all six home shirts. I, I got this literally today oh, because I've been looking for it in in my size for how long? Like for years. And I finally found it on classic football shirts. So like I, I love this from my own childhood because I don't know, this just was when I really got into football and really got to yeah. Burnley. I've been a season ticket holder since I think all four or five. Oh, no, I went to games at all four or five, but I think my first actual season ticket was actually this year when I was like seven. So maybe this is why it's, it's it's, it's in my heart a lot. I remember like Andy Gray, Andy can buy each. For some reason, James O'Connor is in my head when I think of the shirt. Yeah, don't forget Gary O'Connor. Don't forget Gary O'Connor. He was a uh, I, I don't think he played as often, oh. to be fair. He I didn't, think he didn't play I think often. James O'Connor started, I think James O'Connor started like every game for us um, in, yeah. this, in this season. That's why I remember him so well, even though maybe no one else does. Um, so yeah, the, the, I, I like this one for my own sort of own emotional attachment. But yeah, um, I don't know if people know. It's like ninety five, I think. It's an away shirt, which is like a B. It's like yellow. It's yellow with black pinstripes. It's Ensley on it, and I just you may need to Google it. But I really, as I as like the look of it, it's got a collar. I'm a sucker for a collar, and I think Burnley. We need to embrace the B more. I we, we we've done we've not yeah. done that in many years, and I really like the B kind of like vibe i mean we, it's, i know it's not our main thing like brentford that's a, that's that's the main thing but i don't know i like to see a, a proper vibrant yellow and black away shirt maybe in the future um mm. but that's just me so my next question for you and this is another kind of like you know nostalgic one i say uh, what is your all-time favorite burnley game and you may go for one which you was in person and then another one that you were not there in person you could take your pick uh, oh, that's such a hard question. Um, I mean, Wembley was like an amazing experience and that was something like I really got into football. That was when I was like football crazy as a kid. 
So like going to Wembley was like the most unbelievable experience, and to watch us win was yeah. amazing. <sighs> you know I what? Think... I remember from Wembley or so. Like I would have been ten. I went to Wembley with my dad, my brother, and um, his mate Mitch. Sorry, Nelly actually. Sorry if he's watching this. Um, and I don't know why, but like my family, they. I don't know if they had phones or cameras, but clearly not, because like there's like barely any photos from us there, which is really annoying for me. Um, but I remember really well, you know, Morrison's. He goes like the salad bar, Morrison's, right? You're gonna make your own yeah. salad. I yeah. don't know why, but I remember the day before we went to Morrison's. I could make my own salad for like, the first time ever, and I was in the car on that five, four and a half hour journey down to London. And I remember just being buzzing to scran that salad. That with like the pasta and the bacon bits and all that stuff. I remember us being outside Wembley when we finally landed. It was like some sort of car park and just there scranning it. And it sounds really bad, but that's like my first memory of that day. Not us being promoted Premier League, just that salad from Morrison's <laughs> salad. So it's very, it's very, um, you know, I didn't need to add that, but that's just my own personal <laughs> kind of like weird memory of that day. Um, but yeah, continue. Um. See, I, you have to kind of go Wembley because of how good it was. But I, I have to say, right, I, the the Everton match last season at home was like when we scored that that the winner. I've not heard it like there's there's always talk of Michael Keane against uh, Middlesbrough. Yeah, yeah, and I just think that Everton game. We really, I think everyone thought we're actually gonna we're gonna somehow do this and we're gonna pull it back. And it was just the atmosphere was booming at a full time. The whistle went. Everyone was just crazy. There was fireworks. It was like <laughs> this amazing, like, I, I couldn't believe, like, and I'm sat there and I'm like, where the hell has this been all this? Like, for the past couple of years, that that passion that Burnley have, uh, and, it, and it really showed that Everton game. So I tied between two. And I know the Everton one is like one of those ones you'll probably go, yeah, but we got relegated at the end. But that, that game, Going losing and thinking, oh my god, this is it, we're done here, and then turning it round and 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 somehow winning against the odds, it was just amazing. So it's a toss yeah. up between the two. I back that. I back that. Um, it is a tough question. I'll be honest. So it kind of depends on your own kind of perspective and maybe where you are in life and stuff like that. Um, mm. I, I'm I'm very I'm forever grateful for the fact that I saw Burnley play in Europe. Um, I'm sure I'm sure that you did as well. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, did definitely. you Aberdeen or did you Athens? Which one did you go to? I went to the. I only went to the home games, but I uh, my my dad has a season ticket and he uh, couldn't make that Aberdeen game, so I got to go on. <laughs> oh, that's sick! That's sick. Well, I, I'm I'm very grateful and the entire experience of it all. Maybe I'm, I'm cheating a bit because it's not the actual game itself, but just the experience of going to Greece, going to Athens, supporting Burnley. You know, our, our local football club that when I was growing up was just a mid a mid table kind of average championship side. To see us play at Olympiacos in the Europa League, people say it's only qualifiers, but I frankly don't care any less. You know, it was the Europa League, and yeah, to see us there. And you know, when we went, um, it was one one. They went one nil, and then we were we went level of, of a penalty off um, Chris Wood, I believe. Like that, that feeling, and just seeing the Burnley fans the day before, often to piss up in some Irish bar. I remember very well. I think that night I, I got a bit cocky, and I was like buying everyone Jaeger bombs. I keep on being told that when someone sees me and they recognise me, they're just like, "Oh my god, you bought me Jaeger bombs at Athens." I'm like, "Yeah, that sounds like me." Um, <laughs> just the experience of that as a Burnley fan growing up, and like that's why I always thank Sean Dyche for what he did because in reality, we may never have that ever again. And um, that's why the the thought of us going to Wembley in the FA Cup is so special because those are life, li not life changing, yeah. but they that that will stay with you for a long time if we are going to Wembley or if we have that experience in Europe. So yeah, that will forever stay with me. Um, and that's quite an emotional way to end it. So yeah, sorry if people start crying or if I start crying. Anyway, um, Connor. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Um, of course, this is the first video or podcast of the long side. And I was very surprised to see that no one actually took this name after all these years. I, al I always thought about having like a podcast or having like a, a channel. And I always thought, surely someone made the long side, right? Because that's like a, a slogan and a phrase or synony synonymous with Burnley, but apparently not. So it's mine now. So copyright, copyright. <laughs>
Exactly. So, exactly. Connor, thank you very much for your time. If you are new here, feel free to follow us on Spotify or subscribe on the YouTube channel as well. And there'll be other videos. We'll do one about the Preston game as well on the Friday. That's how we'll do like a preview. So, look forward to that. And, Connor, where can the people of Burnley find you? Please don't come to my house, but uh, <laughs> Twitter is. is the best means uh tweeting all the time really uh, especially burnley related stuff uh, it's just at connor norwood um i'm sure is he'll leave a link at the uh for my twitter and stuff but yeah i'm just always tweeting about burnley and I, the more the merrier <laughs> happy days well thank you for your time and for coming on likewise to the viewers or listeners and we'll see you guys next time for another podcast of the long side so i'll see you then